Shush, I don't care if the people who aren't tuned in can't hear me. Nobody can hear me. I'm on the radio. No, no, no. Recorded for posterity. Proster pros posterior? What? Oh, I get you. Record. Record or engage at this tone. Tom. Time! Ah, time. Um. So, in, in, the, in the spirit of ranting about stuff that's, that's annoyed me recently, um, I, I, I have a vague connection to the news current events that uh, that happen around me, but I don't really watch the news anymore. So, I was quite surprised to hear that a soldier had been killed, uh, and apparently, and some big massive uproar was happening about this, because, well, he was had his head cut off with a machete or something like that, uh, which, you know, I, I knew fuck all about. So, I... Read the news story on it. Yeah, okay. Bad thing happened. Okay. No, seriously, no, we're still talking about this? Bad thing... Yeah, bad thing happened. The guy who did it got shot by armed police. So, f f you know, within within about five minutes you had crime and, and summary justice of execution. Which which sort of... Hmm? There were four of them. Who got shot? There were four of them, yeah. Four of them responsible. All four of them got shot. So, so... That kind of bookends that a little bit, but there is a, there is a wider issue, um, which is sort of related to not being racist, but not wanting people to try and bring in cultures that aren't English into England. It was a racially motivated assault in the first place. Would, would you shut up? Just be quiet. Come back to the radio ring. You want to do a radio show? Get a microphone. I'm feeding you information. You're not feeding me anything. Shut up. Uh, I'm ready. That is not a microphone, that is my sky remote. Shut up. Sky remote, my microphone. Nice. Yeah, in any case, A plus radio, domestic train wreck radio. Oh, was at kitchen and didn't feel the poking. I'm sorry. Well, you know, I, it's not my fault if you're in your kitchen. I have a, I have a tome of radio. Michael Dim has a tome of radio. It's like four gigs long. It's creepy. I'm still not entirely sure why. You seem to record my shows and leave everyone else's alone. It's slightly weird. <coughs> Book drive. You do. You do. Yes. Don't don't fucking lag. I forgot you're in the, you're in America, so it, it takes five hours for the radio to get there in the first place. It's half past five where you are, but I can't really do this any later because well, you have like one or two shows of Epsilons, and you have like Failstream doesn't speak. There's no point recording Failstream. Failstream is just like also DJ, but from your computer instead. You get a microphone and I actually have something to say. Gary shows are, the Gary shows are better than mine for that, in that in that regard because well, I, th that's why I said get a microphone. If you don't have a microphone, if if you already had a microphone, me telling you to get one doesn't make any sense. Get hold of one, put it in there. You could plug it into Spotify if you wanted that. Yes, you could. I see. What you, I see. What you, I see what you're getting out there. I I don't really understand the the the, the, the Spotify kind of Last FM sort of cloud-based music solution thing. I don't really understand the, the, the point of this. and I'm, I'm way off subject and I'm on another tangent now, but I sort of kind of mostly listen to music when I'm travelling or when I'm sitting at my desk and work. So, if, I, if I'm out and about, I'm, I'm usually travelling to and from work, and the majority of that is spent either underground or in a valley with no fucking signal at all. Which is a little bit useless then if all of my music is stuck in Spotify in the cloud and I can't get at it because I can't ping through 40 metres of rock or however fucking deep down it's on the zone now. 15 metres or so but the point stands that you know you go you go under a tunnel or something and you lose connection you're, you're suddenly not watching not listening to music anymore right at the time when you kind of want to be listening to music because now there's nothing to look at out the window either so 
I don't really understand why this is apparently a good idea. I can get the whole sort of synchronizing things to devices. I can sync my content from Plex. I can bring it to my phone when I'm sitting at work. If I suddenly decide I want to listen to something that's not on my phone on the way home, I can bring that over from home and put it on my phone and listen to it. That's fine. It's stored locally so it doesn't disappear. But Spotify, I don't think is. I don't. I haven't really used it, but I think as, as from what I've seen, Spotify is just play it from Spotify. You don't get to keep hold of it. You just get to listen to it from somewhere else. Plex is the fucking shit. Plex is fucking awesome. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with it for something that's free. It is extraordinarily well built and seamless as well. I mean, Shit. He loves it. It's good. And I tell you to be quiet. Bitch, please. I don't want this for you. Give me some credit. Apps for mobile devices are paid unless you're smart enough to get them for free. Because, well, you know, you can download an APK from some, for something by simply googling for the name of that product, followed by the letters APK. And. The thing with Plex now is that there's two apps for it. One for Plex and then one for Plex Pass. The Windows 8 app. Well, that's your own fucking fault for running Windows 8, isn't it, you pleb? Yeah, there's there's two apps for Android. There's the, the, the Plex app and there's the Plex Pass app or something like that. But I'm sort of following... The, the Plex Pass app is like the rebuilt, better, beta app for people who, you know... Want to, to, to sign up for Plex Pass and have the additional features and stuff, but it's sort of when I, in actual use, I'm finding the older Plex app a little more use because you get this remote control mode that you don't seem to have in the new version. And I found if it's beta, so I understand it's not finished, but a, a beta test normally means you're finished with the features. Um, the Windows program can have mouse support, actually. But you have to enable it in the settings. Um, the actual application itself is designed to be controlled with a remote. There is a, there is a configuration option. You have to you have to get to the menu first. But if you get say if you get hold of the app for an Android device, for instance, and you um, use that in remote mode, you get a sort of up, down, left, right, back, and back and menu option or something like that. And you can control it that way. Which is very handy from sitting across the room and I've actually, you know, grown into quite liking this method of control. But I do agree the the fact that it doesn't support the mouse. If I'm sitting at the desk trying to, you know, pick something to watch, that's it you know, it doesn't feel as natural using the keyboard like the way though it sort of Wants. There is one major gripe that I'm having with it though, which is that say if you, as frequently happens here, we'll pause something we're watching. Say the the, the baby's just woken up, so we have to go and get the get the child, sort that baby out, and then come back downstairs. And it's been you know ten fifteen minutes or something. Um, when you when you pause a program and sort of it rolls on a little bit, so you you, you resume immediately. You sort of miss thirty seconds of stream time or something like that, generally. So what we'd normally do when we were playing content in VLC was to just roll it back a little bit and and play from there. But Plex doesn't really seem to want to let us do that in an easy way. It's not... There's no sort of grab handle on the progress meter and there doesn't seem to be any reverse control other than a quick rewind and play. Um, So I'm not finding that as intuitive. But for the actual sort of, uh, Dan and I have shared servers with each other, so I can see all the stuff that on his. You know, I'm watching Big Bang Theory from Dan's server in Wrexham, which is quite nice, and it plays quite nicely because Dan has decent upsync, and Dan can watch Pingo off us because that's about all my upsync can support. But it's um, what's well, gross? What did I say? You start playing shit on his tablet from... Yeah, you do. Big Bang Theory is not gross. I'm not hearing a bad word said about it. It's a very good program. Yeah. It doesn't like Big Bang Theory.
What's, what's not to love? Why? He's not a lesbian. No, but he is gay. Is that your point? Yeah. Right. It's imbalanced if he actually is gay. Stargate, are you fucking serious with the Stargate? God. Bennett. Yes, we are just shouting things, and I'm shouting at people for shouting things. You know my opinion on Stargate. Don't even fucking start. Um, Star Wars! I, I, this is another topic, actually, that I'm, um, that I'm want to discuss. The, the, the new Star Wars films, whether they're going to be of any, any, any good at all with, um, fucking Disney and J.J. Abrams directing them. Um, I I rewatched the new Star Trek films. That's a, it's a fucking different um, franchise, I know, but I rewatched the 2009 Star Trek film. It was on Channel Four uh, recently because the new fucking Into Darkness film is coming out. And the more I watch it, the less I like it. I have to say. Um, and then I read a cracked article, which points out how fucked up it is. Because in the original series, and this is you know way off topic again, but in the original series, Kirk is like the youngest captain to command a starship, and he's been through the full academy, you know, fourteen, eighteen years of training to do this diplomatic job on the frontiers and meeting new species and he is the first point of contact and the first experience that these new species and people will ever have of humanity but from the film that J.J. Abrams has made Kirk is now a drunken lout who likes to throw his weight about and you know doesn't really care for authority and he's the captain of the flagship of the star of Starfleet having been in the academy for three years I think you're a bit screwed. The other thing I didn't really like about it is that they, they assemble the crew from this sort of motley band of people who just happened to be there at the same time versus the original concept of they were assigned there in the sort of more logical, orderly fashion that a fleet assigns crew. You assign a captain to a ship and you let him pick his manifest. That's how it works. You don't just sort of have people fall into place because they're supposed to be there. That doesn't work for me, I'm sorry, but that's not how this is supposed to work. And then my biggest gripe with that is that... Well, exactly. It's it's Abrams has taken the sci-fi part and ignored the majority of the science and focused on the ooh, shiny lens flare. So, you know, we have the, the new and improved USS Curvy Shine, which is what the Enterprise used to be, along with its Apple iBridge, uh, and everything is glistening and gleaming, and we've spent many hours polishing various surfaces until they shine, and we'll make fun of the Russian guy's accents as well, because that's fun. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll cater for the, the Star Trek fans not by including any actual semblance of a sensible plot line, or any kind of... De- you know, diplomacy or anything like that, which is what actually made the series worth watching. But instead, we'll just pack the thing with as many references to the original franchise as we can. So you've got the most horrendously segued, ham fisted approaches to nuclear vessels and fucking I'm giving it all she's got and all that crap that really didn't fit in the, in the moment at all. They weren't supposed to be there. They were sort of jammed in as a well. This will this will this will get the trekkies on us, and it doesn't. It doesn't really work. And then, but of course, it's okay because you know you you we're, we're putting on special effects. At what point did anyone ever pick up a phaser in Star Trek and fire it, and a bullet come out of it? Because that's basically what happens in this film. A bullet of energy comes out of it, sort of like the blasters in Star Wars, actually that seem to fire this energy projectile rather than the beam weapon that a phaser has always been. I'm sorry, but that's not... Basically, you've 
you've set up a gunfight with a laser rifle. I don't know how you quite managed to do that, but that was crap. That was utter crap. And I don't like that. <sighs> yes, but that was the, the, the point of them is that it's harder to miss with a beam weapon. You can sweep the area and you're going to hit the target, at least with some of it. I don't know. The, the, the ships still fire. Oh no, they don't. Sorry, they fire stuff the fucking missiles and stuff that's not actually canon Star Trek. And I, 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 I don't like it. I think it's it's too shiny. It's too overexposed, and it's not really a Star Trek film. I have Nemesis in the drawer here. Siobhan bought it for me a little while back. It's still in the cellar thing because I haven't watched it, but I prefer that as a film fair enough I think the, the plotline in Nemesis sort of bothered me a little bit and some of the changes that were made in Nemesis as well got to me somewhat but at least it had some kind of substance I don't know it kept it kept more true to the core of what the, the, the series was about it kept the, you know kept the crew as well the, the cast was obviously something that the, the new Trek film couldn't really do because, well, the cast is all ancient now. But it kept the characters largely the same as well. It didn't, didn't go fucking with established characters in the same way that the, the J.J. Abrams film did. And this bothers me for the Star Wars franchise. This is the point I'm getting to. Because I think I can only see it going the same way. I can only see Star Wars becoming the same special effect induced vomit of overblown action and no fucking substance no star wars is a different beast cuz it's always it's always been feature length film it's always been an action film and it's it's always had a different sort of approach um and it plays well on the big screen but i think compared to say the the first 3 Star Wars films, of which, you know, that they are the actual half-decent ones, um, didn't rely massively on special effects, and I know that's because there weren't so many around when it was made, and obviously, when they revisited it and made the god-awful prequels, there's fucking CGI everywhere, because they can. Sorry, there's a dog going nuts behind me. Shut that thing up. It's only claws and all. Um... Yeah, and they, 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 you know, CG all over the fucking place. And I, I, I can't see it going any, any, any other way. I mean, I haven't seen a film come out recently that hasn't followed this trend. It's either a fucking gritty, re- <laughs> nice picture. It's a, it's a gritty reboot of a gritty reboot of a thing. And I mean, this is the other thing that pisses me off about Star Trek as well. It's a reboot again. I don't. Fair enough. Maybe of all the things that have had reboots recently, it's it's the most deserving of one, having at least been twenty minutes since a previous film was made about it. Not like the fucking Spider-Man reboot that's coming out soon, or the Batman reboot that's just been, or the previous Batman reboot that wasn't that long ago either. I I don't see why we need to reboot these things all the damn time. And every time you reboot them, they get grittier and darker, and the character has to have a few more psychological issues. And eventually, we're not going to have any actual action. We're just going to have a bunch of people sitting in the corner twitching because they're very emotionally traumatized. More reboots than a Windows 98 box. That's actually quite funny. Thank you, Mike. And I, I, I despair for the state of the franchises because... The, the, the Disney has bought the Marvel rights to make Marvel films as well, so we've got quite a lot of superhero films coming out, and things like the Avengers and Green Lantern and all that. Only some of which I've actually seen, so I can only really comment on some of them. But I think, fair enough, you know, if you're going to buy the license to make films out of something, and you know, a corporation like Disney, you're going to do it. 100% and you're going to put your corporate might into it and you're going to make as much money as possible off it. Fair enough, I understand that. But I think the reason the Superman movies worked so well was because there was time between them. And the same with the original Spider-Man movies and the original Star Trek movies and the original Star Wars movies. There was there was enough time between them. And there were few 
far between and of good quality. So we appreciated them when they arrived. You know, the Return of the Jedi came out in ninety five and I remember it because it was the first and last decent Star Wars film to have come out in my lifespan. At least that I was conscious of. And they had to wait six years for the fucking prequel to come out. But even then, you know, there's enough time, but there wasn't enough quality. So, fine. Generations came out in 94, the, the Star Trek film. And then First Contact didn't come out until, like, 98, 99. So, again, you know, there, there, there was enough time in that to make it feel like you'd actually spent time waiting for it. That they, they, they actually bothered to take care and make the thing properly. And yet, now, Disney are releasing, like, two Marvel films a year. And they're promising a, a new Star Wars film, like, every summer, I think it was. And that worries me as well. Because I think you just saturate it too heavily with new crap. And, of course, Disney makes their money off merchandise as well. So... They're, of course, going to flood the market with new characters so that they can make new toys, so that they can then sell these toys to hapless parents who have managed to, you know, spawn children, and these children have subsequently badgered them sufficiently to get them into the fucking Disney shop in the first place. And this all bothers me because I don't see it going well. And it's... I've always been more of a Star Trek person than a Star Wars person, but I I do like Star Wars, and I I don't really want the franchise to just disappear in ignominy. I would have been quite happy for it to just end at Return of the Jedi. And the fan fiction stuff is actually really good, and I think that if you if you if you ignore everything that Lucas has done. Since Return of the Jedi, and you take some of the fan fiction stuff, the stuff that's of higher quality, as canon, then it's it follows on, and it it actually works out quite well. Now, fair enough. Yes, there there is a. I remember being first exposed to Star Wars, and this is a true story. I had I was a Star Trek kid for the majority of my childhood. I didn't really care for Star Wars. I didn't want to know about it, and I'd never watched it. And I was quite surprised to find out that there were only three films in 1995, 1996, you know, when Return of the Jedi came out. And I sort of... I'd, I'd always thought that Star Wars was a sort of a series, in the same way that Star Trek was. You know, we were having... This was the, the part of my childhood when there was, a, there was an episode of The Next Generation on BBC Two every Wednesday. I, you know, I used to watch it religiously, and I thought, well, you know, Star Wars is the same damn thing. It's a series of stuff. But no, actually, no, it's not. It's it's just up until that point, two films, and there had been there was another another film that had just came out, and I thought, wow, that's actually quite quite limiting because there's only well, what, eight nine hours of sci-fi in that. And I, I would argue the point that there have even been six movies, because I don't think you can really count the prequels. I think, it, especially the third one, if you want to talk about things that are ham-fisted, it was so forcibly inserted to fill the gap between two and four. You, 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 before you even went to watch the film, you knew what had to happen in the film. You knew the plot of the film because you know what happens in episode four, and you know what we're going, to, what how we left episode two. So you you know what events are going to transpire in the film before the film. You know you even watched it. You know that you're going to watch the fall of Anakin and the rise of Vader, and that was done poorly. I think it was executed brilliantly visually, but in the terms of the actual substance of the story, it was horrendously lost, where well, if you haven't seen it by now, and I know you have, and you're just being a prat, then it's your own damn fault, and I would commend anybody who has managed to get to this point in their lives without knowing the story if they have any kind of interest in Star Wars Mike, I I actually, um, I have the technical manuals for TNG here, um, and they they're, they're filled with footnotes that are out of canon 
they're sort of notes from the guys who used to work on the sets and stuff like that. And they, they point out that basically what they wanted to do was to create a mini Star Trek movie with every episode, but with a very limited spec F budget. And I think they did a very good job, considering, you know, late 80s sci-fi and visual effects and stuff like that. The first episode, or the, the two-part of the, the Farpoint encounter, was not only a good story, but it was brilliantly done visually. They've remastered it now, and I'm not, I'm not sure about the remastering. I don't know if it if it detracts somewhat because what we're saying here is that yes, okay, you can have the same storyline again. All we've changed here is the the, the visual element, but um, you know, it, it it's that's all that matters. I've seen some of it, and I've also seen some of the original series that's coming out on Sci-Fi now that's also been remastered. I don't think it's 720p, but it's definitely been remastered, because some of the shots of the Enterprise look like they're CG. I know they're not, because they didn't have it then, and the models. But, I, you know, the... Well, I think they I think they actually shot it like that. I don't know what, they, I don't know what the hell they filmed it in, but they filmed it on feature, length, feature film cameras. And just sort of downsampled it or something. So it was it was very high quality when it was made. But um, the the TOS film that I, it wasn't a film; it was an episode. Um, that sort of some of the special effects didn't look like they fit. I mean, the, the actual the quality of the film itself was very good, but the the like the the cuts into the Enterprise and stuff looked like they were CG, and that didn't really fit properly. So I'm neither here nor there on that. I don't know. Maybe yes, okay. The the graphics and the model shots from the original series are somewhat dated now and quite lacking, but they serve the purpose and they fit with the rest of the show. You know, you expect you expect corny, cheesy '60s sci-fi to be corny and '60s and 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 cheesy. You know, and you expect the kind of visual effects that that come along with that. Um, but again, I I don't think that digitally remastering it makes that much difference. Um, if you're watching it, like I watched, I don't remember what it was about. Um, it was this this android guy had created a race of androids to serve humanity, and then eventually decided that actually the best way to serve humanity is to deprive them of their starships because they're just going to go around killing each other, and the, the creative solution to this was to reason with them and overload them with contradicting logic. It was actually really clever. And it, it was a... Fair enough, it's it Bill Shatner overacting and there's other people sort of bouncing around him and Kirk's in every second frame and all the other problems of the show. But it, the, the story behind it was solid and their method of escape... You know, they they couldn't force their way out because these things had control of their ship. They had to convince them to let them to to put them back on the ship and take control again. And that was cleverly executed and very well done. And it's the same I think it's four by three. Or I don't think they've um but I think it's anamorphic. So if you've got sixteen by nine it just pans it with uh, black bars. Yeah, this, I I think that's the point though. I think the if the storyline is good, and if the characters are well fleshed out, which they were, then I don't really think the visual effects are just sort of a layer on top of that. They cater for other people. And the the, the J.J. Abrams stuff sort of forgets the meat and bones of it and concentrates on the dessert. And it's like, well, even in the food analogy, if if that's basically what you're getting... Then you've just had a very dry steak, and you know you didn't really enjoy it much, and now you're having a trifle that's just full of cream. You're gonna come away feeling ill, and that's kind of the same sort of thing that's happening here. It's just so overloaded with visual flashing and strobe lights that it's an epileptic seizure waiting to happen. But it's just, it's not really a film so much as it is just an orgy of look what we can make a computer do I mean I, I had the same problem with Avatar when it came out because here's a film that's been 
designed to be shot in 3D and the guy held on to the story for 10 years or something until the technology existed to um, to display it. Now, yeah, Avatar waited for 3D to come out. I haven't seen it in 3D. I've only ever seen it on a small screen. I've seen it in 2D. And I don't feel like I miss anything. Um, maybe somebody could tell me that the, the difference, you know, the big sort of problem of not watching it in 3D... But Avatar, Avatar had a solid story in that humans are dicks, and you know we have to. Fair enough, they they went so far as to helpfully actually just call the thing that they were after unobtainium, which seemed a bit odd at the time. But they had, they had a story, and it was quite well thought out. It was sort of this guy infiltrates another culture, starts to learn about it, and is a bit conscientious. So he winds up learning to be one of these people. And forgetting, you know, the other or old human ways and all that bollocks. And it was it was actually a good film. And I don't think the special effects spoiled it. It was very beautifully done and it was carefully blended. And I think that was what I liked about it. Not the fact that it was done in three G three D and C G, but the fact that it was carefully done. This the line between where the CG started and the, the the live action ended was quite difficult to pick out, but I initially didn't see it because I I heard the story of this guy had waited until the technology was available, and I got the wrong impression. I thought actually yeah okay so I, I, this guy's just focusing on the on the CG and the the visual effects and crap like that, and I didn't go and watch it. And when I finally did see it, I sort of realised the difference between the impression that I'd had and the truth, which is that here was a man who had painstakingly made a film that I think it was it was perfectly on the line, actually, between having beautiful graphics and having a good story and and it made a very good watching experience and I don't feel like I've gone to that film and seen the same sort of thing as I've seen in Star Trek 2009, where all I've basically seen is a screen flashing at me for an hour and a half, and I've come away with a headache, because that's kind of all I remember of that film. I know there is a plot in there, but it was a cop-out in the first place. There are a few things that Star Trek did very rarely and sparingly, and there are reasons they did them rarely and sparingly. Those two things are parallel universes and time travel. Because... These are these are sort of Deus Ex Machina. They are very powerful plot devices that are just too easy to fuck up. It's basically God mode. And if you have ever taken a game that you're enjoying and turned on some cheats, you pretty quickly stop enjoying it. I've I've tend to fan this. I I used to cheat quite a lot when I was a kid, and I I pretty much do what I wanted to do and then finished playing the game. I was bored of it then. Because I've taken it as far as I can. I've thrown down the nuke and there's nothing else really now to do. And time travel in in sci-fi is kind of that. It's sort of yeah, here's a gaping plot hole but we can get around that because paradox because time travel. I've only ever seen one sci-fi series I think do time travel successfully and that's Doctor Who. And I think it's because it's not so much that we are creating weird and wonderful situations with time travel, although that has happened a few times, and it's just basically we're setting this episode in this time, deal with it. We're setting this episode in another time, deal with that. And they they blend that in quite well. The parallel universes thing, I first saw done well in Sliders. Um, again, it was the premise of the the, the series. It was oh dear, we're stuck in various different parallel universes and we only have a limited amount of time in each one of them and then we move to the next one conveniently enough right at the end of the episode um, we always have about an hour actually That that I, I watched it in the 90s and I quite enjoyed it it was well made and yeah it was a bit of a vehicle but it served a purpose and again it wasn't overdone but it was the, the whole sort of basis of the series and I can see why Abrams sort of felt it necessary to to do this whole sort of separate timeline 
separate things away from the established canon of Star Trek because there have been a lot of Star Trek films. And there have been a lot of Star Trek series, and there's an awful lot of canon Star Trek, and it's difficult to carve out your own Star Trek franchise thing from from Ground Zero with the Kirk crew and the original series, because it's the start point of the hit, you know, it's the start point of the timeline. Sean bought a two pound scratch card. Want a tenner? No. Look properly. That's hundred and ten pounds. Okay. What a problem. Yeah. Um. You're, you're you're changing things at the very beginning of the timeline, and I know that there's a prequel of Enterprise. I didn't really mind it that much, though. I didn't think it was brilliant. Um. It had its moments, but. That's the kind of thing that they have, they, they've now started to have to do because Kirk's time is very well established with, you know, six, seven films, was it? The Kirk's film? Well, as my Generations was half set in Kirk's time and half not, so I think you can sort of give it six and a half, maybe. Um, and, a, and a good, you know, stack of series, of the original series that really fleshed out what happened. So we're quite happy that, you know, Kirk's time is well established. And I can see that it's it's then difficult to make your own new thing that comes from that crew and that that, that, that time period. I just kind of wish that it didn't have to go down this route of, well, now we're going to completely cut away and do our own thing. And to, to prove this point, we're going to blow up Vulcan. Uh, yeah, okay, so... We've destroyed the home planet that's, like, the f- a- uh, biggest ally that humanity have got. And I, it, it, it irritates me now, because now there's this sort of very clearly defined separate thing going on. But it's sort of always struck me as a lazy way to tell a story, and a lazy way to do it. And it's a cop-out. It's a kind of... Well, I want to tell my own story. I don't want to do anything of your uh, anything like actually Star Trekky. But I'm having all your characters, and I'm taking all this, you know, ships and established things, and I'm just going to make them go over here and fight. And that I don't think works. But the, the whole point of this tangent really was to show that the Star Wars films, which I care less about, <laughs> probably are going to follow the same suit. Um, I don't know if anybody else agrees, but. I I can't see it happening any differently. I think it's just going to go on the same route. And I don't know why we're letting people like J.J. Abrams do this to our beloved sci-fi franchises. I really don't. It's sort of painful in a way. Um, Watching these films, and and I have childhood memories of watching the, the characters that are being portrayed in these films change and and I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to work out. But you know, I don't think as well. It, it probably may be better that there will be more Star Wars films because, like I said, I was surprised to hear that it was so hamstrung by having so little content. But Star Wars, as I think George Lucas found out towards the end of his ownership of it, never really belonged to him in the end after Return of the Jedi. It it always belonged to the the fan base that sort of adopted it and started making their own fiction out of it. And I think here is where most of the butt hurt from Episode One came about because all of the changes that were made and all of the differences that came about and the fact that it just wasn't a very good film offended people more because they've fallen in love with this thing and they'd adopted it as their own and then basically somebody else is coming in and saying actually no this is the way things are now and I kind of think of it as in the same way that if you if you hear a song wrong and you start singing it the way you think it is and you find out later that you're singing the wrong lyrics all this time and the original actual lyrics just don't seem right because, well, mine are better. 
I've known that this is the case, which, but I still don't think that that's the way it's supposed to be. Even though these the people that wrote the song wrote it that way, the people that are writing the films are writing it differently. I don't think that's the way it's meant to be. I think I know better. And that's kind of what I think's happened with Star Wars in a way that the community's got hold of it and has just taken it in a direction. And the fanfic stuff, I've only read a small part of it, I'll be honest. I've only read three or four stories, but the three or four stories that I've read have been high quality. I think one of them dealt with um, the Jedi Academy after after episode six. Um, Skywalker starts an academy for Jedi, and obviously that was reflected as well in the game after the fact. But it's not canon, um, although it was LucasArts game. Um, but the book that I read basically followed the, um, the remnants of the Empire trying to basically restore the the Empire as was and Skywalker and his band of Merry Jedi trying to stop them and I read another one that focused completely away from the Jedi and concentrated on Leia and Chewbacca and Han and what they got up to afterwards and that was quite an interesting read as well because it was cleverly done Um. And I often think with Star Wars, it's quite difficult to, to, to make a story that doesn't focus on the central elements of lightsaber fights and force mastery and, and users. Because there is, a, there is a whole set of sub-stories that go on in Star Wars. There's a whole sort of thing with the Death Star, and it's kind of difficult to imagine what life would be like in that universe, where you have these planets that are sparsely populated but uh, entirely different worlds the the one thing that I liked about Tatooine was that it was very different it was clearly all desert and there was nowhere really to survive other than these moisture farms You know, that that, that was a clever thing in itself it's a desert planet and they're basically they're farming water out of the planet and selling it which makes sense because that's what you'd sell Here is a planet that's limited on water, so we're extracting it from the ground and we're going to sell it, in the same way that this is a planet that's low on oil. So we will extract it from the ground with difficulty and we'll sell it to you for the price that it costs. And that, I like. That was detail. And the fine detail is reflected in the fanfic. It's cleverly brought up and and dealt with. So I, I I believe that the future of that franchise probably lies more with its community created content than it ever will with whatever the hell canon comes out next because I I really can't see it being any good um, and that I think is the point I'm going to make. Uh, I have a, a confession to make as well from this morning. I uh, completely different topic. Uh, if I if I can change topics now finally it's been about two hours on this one topic um, I made a, I made a, I made a mistake yesterday uh, in in work and I Mega Man? oh go on do so I'll finish up my story a, a very subtle typo has now caused me to, to, to miss out on quite a lot of stuff <laughs> I missed out a comma in a sequel statement and as a result a lot of orders don't have, have any products attached to them I fixed it this morning, but it's kind of bad in that, you know, these people have ordered a product, they've paid their money, but nobody knows quite what to send them. So that was a bit of a whoops. And that was all because of a comma missing. Uh, I don't I don't know how Mega Man falls into this, Mike, so you you may want to... No, woo, it's not that, it's point of sale. The data was never saved in the database in the first place. It was never input into the system. There's no way to get it back. It's just... It, it's one of those things, because the insert fails, because of the syntax error, it, the data just is lost, and the site doesn't handle the error either. So that was a bit bad. Um, so yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I um, I'm not... I'm not sure what's uh, what the best cause of action there is. So there's a fan fix flash out a huge really dramatic story from the Mega Man and Mega Man X universes. Yeah, well I I think with Mega Man I've only played one game of Mega Man. Um but I I did quite enjoy it. Obviously the Game Boy game. It was 
Mega Man 3 or something like that. But I I fell in love with the Proto Men well before I realised actually that they, they their songs were about loosely about the Mega Man universe. And I think they really bring it to life. Fair enough, yes, they are mostly non canon, they take the characters and they put their own spin on them. But the story that they run through in Act Two is is fantastic. And it that really sort of brought the whole series to life for me, isn't it? It it adds a lot of depth to what I remember as being a fairly linear platformer game. Um imagining that, you know, all of this storyline is going on in the background really sort of made it a bit more magical. And I I think that's the way with a lot of other fanfic. But I don't I haven't seen the other fanfics about it, the Mega Man X stuff I've not seen at all. Is it Mega Man X? Is it Mega Man Ten? I don't know, I can't remember. Um But it took a long time to to get it is X. That's not helpful. Well, it could still be an X or a ten. You prat. I don't know which it is. Help! No, but I. Well, I know. You know, I started listening to the Proto Man because of Pablo, actually. And he introduced it to me because of Light at the Night. X is Star Trek TNG to the TOS in Mega Man. X, right, fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I, well, I haven't seen any of the X stuff then. Uh, I've only seen the original stuff. But I... I don't know. It's, fanfic is usually either hit or miss. Some of the Star Trek stuff is god-awful. And some of it is really good. And I think when people with skill get together and do it gently and carefully and they take canon elements and they, you can add your own twist to it but you have to blend it in with what's already established. And I think, you know, th- there's some stuff out there where people have just, you know, they've gotten the costumes and they've gotten the camera and they've gone, right, let's fucking go for it. And yeah, it is. It is about 99% of it. Because there are few people with the literary or... movie <sighs> talent. I don't know if that's not a word, but you know what I mean. With the directoral talent, perhaps, to actually tell the story and convey it in the same way that Hollywood does and Paramount does and the original mech, the original storyteller did. It, it it is a skill and it's not a skill that everyone has, but it is a skill that a lot of people seem to think they have. Um, I don't have it myself, and that's probably why I haven't released any fanfic. But I did used to do collaborative, cooperative fiction based on Star Trek. It was like a play by email thing or something like that. Well, that was more for that was for fun. I mean, that wasn't for any particular purpose, but it was strictly canon that we did, and it was shut down after a while for inactivity. But it was fun at the time because it's sort of a way to pull into the universe of you know what's going on, but not have to stick with it. You can add your own stuff. There is a lot of space within the established elements, you know, you can have your own class of starship with its own experimental fucking slipstream driver, whatever the hell you want to add into, you know, you can have it powered by hamsters that you know, roll around the ship in zero gravity, whatever the hell you want, you know, as long as it ties in somewhere, and there's a reason for it, then I don't really see why not, but I think... If you're going to have something like that, you've got to have it for a reason. You can't just say that this is, you know, we are powering our starship. And it, it is powered by tribbles. RPG mod fully force. Uh, 
there's there's got to be a point to it, and there's got to be a reason for it because you're playing with established, not just established characters, but established empires with Star Trek. You're <laughs> no, <they're> hamsters. <laughs> you're playing with things like Starfleet, and you're playing with the Romulan Empire and the Klingons and stuff. I can see the Romulans enslaving Tribbles to power their starships quite happily, but I can't see Starfleet doing it because they're too moral. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, you can't just randomly say that this is the thing because it is. But you can have it in your storyline if you think about it hard enough and you reasonably, reasonably, rationally explain why it exists. What, what is it there for? I think it, it's the same kind of thing of inventing something in, in, in real life. You have to fit, you have to solve a problem. You have to say, right, okay... This is serving a purpose. There is a reason for this thing to exist where it previously did not exist in the first place. And I think that's the same kind of question you have to ask of the universe in which you want to add content. You know, if I add this triple-powered warp drive, does it solve a problem that dilithium is too hard to get at, or does it just raise further issues that triples are actually born pregnant and we shouldn't make them work for a living because they're actually already pregnant and they need to just sit down and breed? And other than that, they're fucking useless. I would personally just shovel them into the engines and burn them, because there are that fucking many of them, but they are living things, and you're not supposed to do that. Mm, fair enough. If you're a Romulan, that might not be an issue for you, but if you're a Starfleet officer, you are kind of bound by some kind of moral code. They play on it a lot in all the canon that you ever see. And yet... I've seen fanfic that sort of ignores that. And I don't really think you can do that. You can't get away with saying that, oh yes, but they're, they're just they're bad members of the Federation or something like that, without giving a reason for it, a credible backstory. It's just putting the effort in. You know, if there's a, a, a renegade ship out there, that's what you want to set your story, then fine, but why? Why have they turned renegade? What has happened to break their allegiance to the federation that they all belong to that provided them with a ship and training. You know, something has to change as a result. You know, fair enough, it can just be the captain has turned renegade and then the crew have no idea that they've broken away from the federation and they're just following orders. That is a story. But, again, there's still... There needs to be some kind of reason behind it. You know, maybe there's some guy high up in the federation... Red October in Space, fair enough, it is kind of that, but that was actually what I was thinking about when I said it. But th- there was a reason behind the character's defection in Red October. It was a, it was a story element. It wasn't just a because it is. Because this is the way things are. Because we said so. Because we're writing the story. Clancy had it figured out. Clancy is a good storyteller, I think. But I, I don't see why... Because it's sci-fi, I think people just ignore that. Focus on things like, ooh, super duper warp drive that goes at warp 9 million. And, and I go back to the technical manual for that one. Because there's a there's a footnote on the, on the warp drive page, actually. And it says, early on in the series of developing TNG, they, they knew quite quickly that it would be very easy to make the starship too fast. If you consider the size of the galaxy that we know and how long it takes to cross it at light speed, then you're very quickly going to run into, actually, there's just too much space, and the ship is too fast. And you have to have that dramatic element of, there are no other ships in range, or there are no other, you know, it's going to take us four hours to get there, and we need to get there in two. You know, that doesn't work if you can travel at 50 million times the speed of light and get there in a heartbeat every time. Then, fair enough, yes, the, then more distance, but there are, there are considerations for interstellar space. Galaxies exist, and things, you know, aren't as well played out. So they toned it down, and they said, well, okay, so the, the galaxy is the canvas, but only this this portion of it, this quadrant that we inhabit, is... Yeah, basically, yeah, it's got 16 quantum torpedo launchers, and, and it, I I have been down the power gaming route myself and it's fun at first but then it is just like god mode you've you've done it then and there's nothing else to accomplish with it 
there's no challenge in it if you've got all that and you you know it, there's, why, why bother what's the point anymore you know stick with the established stuff the fair enough the enterprise itself is a very high powered vessel but it's it it suffers from this thing <laughs> This has always pissed me off about Star Trek, but what is, the, what is the point in it having shields? And why don't they have circuit breakers on board? This, you know, it's a whole realm of stuff that I could go into, but I don't have time. Um, but there's there's got to be drama in it, and the the films and the series were always carefully shot to have the hero element in it of basically, oh, we're about to lose. We're going to die. We are. Oh no! Suddenly we are suddenly resurgent, and we are valiantly fighting off the enemy and winning. But without that moment of loss, without the enemy surging forth and actually causing you to work for it, it's just cruise control. You are winning too comfortably, and there's no story in that. Why do they talk to a ten-foot tall snake like hey? And then people go, "What the fuck did Data?" I d- this is a universe in which every alien that you seem to meet is bipedal and can, to some extent, speak English, whether it's translated or not. The thing with the universal translator is it also seems to translate people's jaw movements so that they look like they're mouthing the words to you in English, which is a bit odd. So either they all speak English, really, and the universal translator doesn't work... Or it actually just changes your perceptions of things, and you know they are speaking their own language, and you hear it in English. Fine. But whereas the aliens in Star Trek don't didn't didn't ever really deviate. Yes, they did that in Red October as well, where they were speaking English, but they were actually speaking Russian. I know. Um, they didn't really deviate from the template of. Two legs, you know, two arm, two arms and a head, and there is a TNG episode where they 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 call this out basically, and they say, um, well, actually, there's a reason for this, and the the there are these people called the Guardians of Forever, which is a, a it's touched on in like TOS and it's touched on in TNG, and then there's a series of books about it that are fanfic, and it's really clever in that it it touches on this canon elements from two series and draws a line between them and then extends it and follows it because in this this idea that basically these are creatures who created the universe and sort of like a, an overall deity effect they created different species from the same set so there is enough commonality between a human and a Klingon and a Romulan that they all appear as bipedal and they all appear as, you know, two arms, I don't know what the, the thing is, like, bibrachial or something like that, and, and with one head and, you know, two eyes and nose and a mouth and vaguely humanoid, um, because they're all from the same set. Uh, and you have to go a long way to find an alien in Star Trek that wasn't. I don't think there were any. Although I know that the, um, that amorphous black blob thing that killed... Tasha Yar, that was that wasn't, but that wasn't really an alien that was the collective emotions of a series of aliens that probably were um, and I, I, I'm struggling to think of any that haven't, but there were a lot of energy beings, yeah I, I was about to go on to that um, there were a lot of beings that were composed of pure energy that, like the Organians for instance, and the Thorians the Thorians you never saw was it the Thorians or was it the um, Tholians? That was it. But then you never really saw them though. They were always blacked out, and it was like lit from behind. Yeah, I don't, I don't take Enterprise as canon. I haven't seen enough of it. Uh, and again, I, Enterprise is redone in the noughties. And Crystalline Entity is a good show, actually. I'll give you that one. Crystalline Entity was well, was a very good piece of storytelling. Um, and the fact that the death of it as well, it recurred quite a few times actually, and the death of it was was well played out as something that was not right. Um, and I, I liked that. That was a that was a that was a good story arc to follow. Um, 
But again, yeah, okay, we've we've two species out of what fifty, sixty. You see a lot of bipedal humanoid aliens. If you look at like the Starfleet Academy things, you've got Bolians and you. Well, where's the question? Maybe Greece, I think. Uh, you've got Bolians and you Romulans and the the guys with the little um, smoke things in their chests and stuff like that. But they're all humanoids. Um, well, I was basically talking about the, the the story. You can't, you can't just say that things are the way they are for no apparent reason. Um, and again, yeah, that's that's kind of the end of that point. I think I've, I've lost my train of thought. Fuck it. So basically, an awful lot of stuff about Star Trek means that Star Wars is probably not going to be good. Um. I'm not sure quite how that works, but I know that it's true as well, which is worrying. It's sort of worrying state of affairs for a lot of the sci-fi stuff, and I think it's because it's becoming a lot more socially acceptable to be a geek. Well, what the, what passes for being a geek, um, which apparently is wearing glasses and having a smartphone, which covers a striking number of people who I would not class as being geeks. Um... And that that's that's kind of irritating because well I, I sound like a hipster if I say that it, it's it's not fun when the mainstream gets involved but I I don't understand why though why would somebody say that to you you know I I have lived my entire life without feeling the need to randomly spontaneously announce my preference in television shows to random people what why. Yeah, fair enough. You're making small talk and you're buying an Enterprise E. That's a bit different. I'll give you that. But, again, you know, it, it did used to be a guilty pleasure it's to some in some regards. And it used to be something that, you know, you didn't bandy it around school a lot when I went to school because you would get you, well, picked on at least, beaten up was more like it. Um, because being a geek at the time was difficult, you know, it, it meant being socially awkward and inept and having to go through this whole weird thing with girls and whether they liked you or not, I was never actually quite really sure, I'm still not, there's one sitting on my couch, I don't know what she's doing there, God, thanks. Oh, fair enough, um, but I, I think that's the reason it annoys me, I've, I didn't choose to be the way I am. And I have had to live with it. You know, it's not been easy to get to this age and stay interested in the things that I am. Because it, the, the, there are an awful lot of times when, you know, people would have ridiculed the things that I like and the reasons that I like them. Um, and I, I've grown up in the northwest of England and I don't like football and I don't quite know how that happened either but I work in Liverpool and even in even now in my mid 20s people find it odd that I openly dislike football and I don't think that that's right but I can see kind of even in even in a digital media company full of programmers where I work 70% of the people there seem to be in, interested in talking about football and I couldn't care less but it it was always a sticking point for me as a kid because it used to get me picked on. Um, I do realize who I'm talking to. Not hand egg, the other one. Actual football. But it was always sort of something to talk about in school. And I, I, I will admit, I did at one point involve myself in it. Um, mostly my stepdad's insistence, we sort of had a period of time when I did follow football but I never stuck with it, I did enjoy it I won't lie, but I didn't stick with it for long enough because I didn't have that much of an interest in it I don't know why, I don't know what it is about it but I just don't like it, I like Formula 1, it's the only sport I like, and that's fine no, it's not, I like snooker as well 
And that, that gets me ridiculed a lot. I can't watch snooker in my house. I'm not allowed to. That's probably boring. Something like that. No, I don't like golf. Golf is annoying. Golf is just like fucking torture. Well, what were you talking about? But, like I say, growing up like that was not easy. Because, that I come from a family which, well, I come from two different families, but that's a whole another story. <laughs> but, the guiding principle of my childhood was fit in. So, I, I sort of did and I didn't. And I don't really know quite which way it went, but I would pretend to like stuff because other people liked it and I don't think I'm alone in that I know that other people have done it because it sort of smoothed the transition into fair enough it's been three years in the same school and I haven't made any friends maybe I need to just sort of feign an interest in whatever the hell these people are talking about um, but the biggest thing around when I started high school was Pokemon it really exploded around the time when the first Game Boy games were coming out, and that was about the time that was late primary school, early secondary school, and the cards came out, and everyone was talking about it, and it was okay after the explosion to be into Pokemon. But when you were riding the leading edge of it, when you had the game and nobody else knew it, really existed it was it was sad it was you know that that geeky thing again whereby you know it's because it's not well known people sort of ridicule it by default almost and then of course after it exploded it was all fine and nobody would hear you say you know well i i was playing this last week and you told me it was a silly child's toy oh actually no no it's fine now and the same thing happened with a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, the Digimon thing, I don't really understand. I don't, I don't remember that well. I think it, it, it was a couple of years after Pokemon. It was the same sort of thing. Um, I don't recall that it's actually sort of carried on in any way, shape or form. I don't think it hit the big time. Yeah, it, sort of, it, was, a, it was a pale imitation, as I recall, actually, of Pokemon. And it never really worked. But it existed, and it was briefly somewhat popular for a time and primary school was all about stickers football stickers we have this thing every year they bring out a sticker album and packs of mixed up stickers and people collect the stickers and put them in a sticker album and they're all about football players there's the Premier League sticker thing I don't know if it's still going it certainly was when I was in primary school the people would stand there on the playground Identifying what cards, what stickers they had, and what stickers they didn't, and that that followed through to Pokemon cards. But it wasn't cool to do it at first. It was never cool to be into Pokemon, even when it, even after it exploded, it was still not quite a mainstream thing. It was on the, on the cusp of it, but it was like sort of not quite there. Um, and I, I, yeah, I lived in Southport, which is a sort of somewhat isolated community that is perhaps slightly up its own ass. Um But I I came from a certain part of the country, and I was raised in a certain way, and maybe my experiences are different to other people's. But I found myself not really fitting in with other people, and I I don't think it's 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 necessarily. Maybe not. Maybe it's not fair of me to say, but I don't think it's right for people to say, "Ah, yes, well, I'm I'm a geek." Now that it's fashionable to be a geek, people pretend. Again, it, it comes in with that whole sort of pretending to fit in. Yeah, I'm a geek. I'm into this. I'm into that. Well, yeah, no, clearly you're not. You don't really seem to know what it means. And the term nerd, I don't really. I don't, it's more of an American term. I think both both terms are probably American, but I think. One is apparently disturbing parallels. What's the disturbing parallels here? Please elaborate. But one that I read, a, I read an article in the, the the free newspaper that comes on the train. It's called the Metro, and in there it was talking about people who 
would rather be identified as a geek than a nerd, and there is a difference in stereotype, and there's a difference in things, but I don't, I never, I, I would use the terms interchangeably, I think that they mean the same thing, and they are, they're, they're, there is a difference, though, a nerd implies, like, the nasally kid out of the Simpsons, and, thing, whereas geeks are less of that, and a bit less... A bit less socially corrupt, but no less technically capable. I think I don't know quite how it's supposed to work, or what these words are supposed to mean. But in my family, I am, or I always have been, the the, the go-to person for anything that breaks or any computer issue that happens, because I've always been into that. Um. Um, I have seen it. Briefly. I don't know. I'm looking for something. Oh, just found it. Yeah, I... Geeks know their stuff, and... You can... Perhaps say the same about a nerd, though. I don't know what... That's that's actually... I don't know if there's a difference. I was always a geek when I was a kid, and it wasn't cool to be a geek at the time. So, it was... Yeah, like I said, it was difficult to grow up and, and openly be a geek, but I, I was, kind of didn't really have a choice, you know, I had glasses since I was nine, I've had ridiculous Lego Man hair for about the same amount of time, and I have a complexion that occasionally erupts into pepperoni pizza, particularly when I was going through puberty, and that kind of all combines to produce a particular look that's sort of symbolic of a certain way of being. So, yeah, alright, fine. There was not maybe much I could do to hide it. But never really seeing the sunlight probably didn't fucking help. You know, I I had a computer at home. I would sit in my room for, well, days at a time, if I ever got the chance. I was sort of forced into into interacting with other kids, and I didn't really want to. Um, and I don't think, I think it cheapens it now. I guess is what I'm driving at. Where when people say, "Oh yeah, I'm a geek and that's that's cool, it's all fine," you know, because because it's because it's happening and it's now and it's all the kinds of buzzwords that I don't really know why people use. Because well, yeah, okay, maybe you've decided you'd like to join in with a technical revolution. Fine, that doesn't mean you have to call yourself a geek and immediately mean that there was no reason for me to grow up the way I did. I could have just. Grown up like a normal kid, and then eventually decided, I'm going to be interested in technology now. Because it's a fucking choice. Obviously. I'm not about to say that, you know, I'm, I, I, I choose to do the networking stuff that I do, and I chose to go and work as a programmer, but these are things that I'm interested in. And I don't think you can pretend to be interested in something. At least not for a great length of time. I mean, you, you can feign an interest in something for a short period of time, but... If you're interested in something, you're interested in something. You know, I have an interest in a lot of things, but there are things I, I'm not interested in. I'm I'm interested in trains. I'm not that interested in planes. Um, I'm interested in computers, and I'm not that interested in football. And that kind of defines who I am. And fine, that's that's it. But you can't say right, okay. I choose to be interested in in technology. What lines am I drawing? Please fucking tell me, because I'm not I'm not listening to it from your point of view. You'll have to explain to me what I'm saying that is drawing lines in your mind, because I'm not I'm Photoshop is being happening over yonder. I am. Um, I've forgotten what I was saying. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. I didn't grow up as a gay kid, but I can perhaps see what you're coming from. Again, it, equally, again, it's something that isn't a choice. So, yeah, oh, fair enough. Um, but it wouldn't have occurred to me until you said it. To be honest, <laughs> but, but you can you can see what I mean. In the, if someone was to turn around to you and say, "Right, that's that, that I, I am that way as well," because it's now cool to be that, it sort of cheapens all of the 
having to go through being a geek or a gay child and uh, yeah it, it, it annoys me I suppose um I imagine being gay as a kid is probably worse because I remember when I was a kid people bandy about being gay as an insult and say alright well you're now gay and that's clearly the worst thing I could possibly have called you and it was sort of strangely accepted that this was a bad thing to be as a child um, and nobody wanted to be called it really uh, I actually got in trouble for calling somebody um, I think I was about six so you know, don't judge me too harshly but um, no no I didn't I, don't, I suppose it is but it's it's that kind of thing though, isn't it where it, it's taken effort to get to a certain position in your life and you look back on it and you see other people trying to just emulate the the happy part when you've got to be where you are and you're happy with who you are and what you are and what you identify yourself as and then you see other people going yeah well I'm this too and you say, no no you, you, you just not stop it stop it now uh, how the fuck I got onto this I don't know um, but uh, oh, it's talking about enterprise e models and stuff like that. Um, no, what was after that as well? Ah, oh, fuck, I don't, know, I don't know what I was saying. It's really late now. It's like quarter to midnight, and I've been doing this for about four hours, um, two hours actually. So, like that. but that's plenty of time for me. So I'm gonna head off because talking like this for a long period of time hurts my throat and I can't keep doing it and I keep forgetting what the fuck I'm talking about uh, I will do more radio at some point Enterprise E Geek Culture Bonus I don't recall talking about bonus but no shit now I am damn you right <laughs> it is time for me to leave um, thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to just rant at you for a while uh, I thought you'd find something to talk about I uh, I usually do eventually find something to talk about when I'm busy apparently hiding from me every time I try and click on it it's not there anymore I can't can't access the media music thing ah there it is hello right I uh I'm gonna go but I will leave you with the musical stylings of something once I've found it because I have it somewhere and I can't remember where I put it uh, uh, and that's that's what I was after. And yeah, I keep forgetting things. It's since I was ill. I was ill on Tuesday. I, I, I went back to bed in the end. I just couldn't stand up and I couldn't concentrate on anything. And it's sort of the same now. I'm really struggling to keep my concentration. Um, but yeah, I'm. I've I've worked out what I was doing now. So fuck off. Nice. Tatty bye, folks. I can't. St- I can't. Ah, damn you.